Now you know that we have all been baptized and are called Christians. And so we should put forth the effort to know what it means to be a Christian person and to have the name of Christian. And also what one must do to be one. Not simply living as a Christian only in name, but in truth. Similarly, when a construction worker wants to pursue their desired trade, they must truly know and study the trade in order that they may fairly be called a plumber or architect or electrician. It's not a free-for-all. They need to be licensed and prove to the world that they are going to do good work. If the person in training could never demonstrate that they can do what they claim they can, if they claim to be an electrician but really can't do it safely and effectively, that would be a disgrace. Likewise, if a person calls themselves a lawyer or a politician and doesn't even know the law, they would be a laughing stock. And so we too, calling ourselves Christians, must establish our name and demonstrate that we are rightly to be called Christians. It is the divine teachings of Jesus Christ that are to consume our lives. We are to put the teachings of Christ even before our own opinions, and therefore must guard against the human teachings and human commandments, the worldly wisdom that seeks to dominate our lives and hopes to trick us into setting aside our faith for its solutions. It would be a grave problem for this world's ways to take root in us, making us Christians in name, but not in action. Against the teachings of the world, we ought to first open our mouths wide to rejoice in the teachings of Christ, to be proud of the divine wisdom, the faith that we have been given, even if this world does not understand it. We are to cultivate and let take root the gospel in our lives by coming to church, listening to sermons, regularly partaking in Holy Communion, and reading our Bibles. For this is what all Christians who came before us have shown us how to do it, how to be Christians. Being a Christian has never meant not regularly coming to church. That is a worldly teaching that tells us that we can have a good relationship with Jesus without being a part of his community, the church. That is pure rubbish. And in doing so, we do a disservice to our children. Who will not have a relationship with Jesus Christ apart from Christmas and Easter? The church exists to share the good news of God in this world. We need it, and in our baptisms, promised to do these things regularly. There's good reason why Paul, Peter, and especially Jesus Christ spent their lives sharing with us the word of God, a divine message of grace sent directly from heaven into this world that does not have it apart from God. There is purpose in the Christian life that the worldly just don't get, but it's there for the taking if we want it. Well, we don't have all the answers in the church. We are given a relationship with God and each other here in this place where we discover what our hearts truly need. And while it is true that I nor anyone else can ever preach the word adequately, the Holy Spirit is here. Where two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, and she, the Holy Spirit, is preaching it, translating the preacher's words into the true gospel as the sound waves travel across this room and shake your eardrums. Her work takes place in this moment to all who are indeed given the Spirit. This gospel of Jesus Christ, though, in this world, especially what you hear out there in modern culture on the Hallmark Channel and in evangelical books and movies, is not the word of God, not by a long shot. God have mercy on us. The theology of glory tells you everything you want to hear, and it is not the truth of the gospel as it is written for us in the Bible. And where it is not being truly preached, but watered down so that we are never challenged and transformed, we find there tomfoolery, corruption, and the devil himself. Who, too, can quote scripture and lead us down paths that we would prefer to go instead of the path that leads us to the cross where Jesus is taking us? And so then the first thing to learn is the teaching of Christ and not that of this world of the people who give easy answers and only sell us what we want to buy. This world's wisdom, 
the rules of this world that tell us that our value comes from obeying them, that our freedom comes from our subjugation to them, they need to be thrown out, which is highly necessary at the present time. For through them, many people are led astray, tricked into the ways of our modern consumerist culture, buying our salvation and comforts instead of having faith that they come from God alone. This world wants to draw us from, draw us into its salvation and laws and away from God and grace. We truly need to be careful to not listen to what we want to hear, but to let the gospel be preached in its purity, which came from God and was proclaimed and revealed to us from heaven. But how can you tell if the gospel you are hearing is the right version? What sign is there for us to recognize this, to know if the preacher is truly preaching what God wants to say? The answer is quite simple. It is, all, it is as it has always been in the church, where the gospel is spoken and heard, persecution follows. If the whole community speaks well of the pastor, that is surely the sign that the real good news, that that our sinful selves despise, is being withheld from us. Where the preaching and the preacher is not persecuted or spoken against, it is not the gospel at all, and the preacher is not preaching it. The gospel is always persecuted. The hypocrites murmur against it, but their works are nothing. Direct yourself by that. Know the truth by this. The gospel has always been persecuted. The truth has always been chased out of town. In the book of Acts, it is with the presence of persecution how the early church gained confidence that they really were following in the footsteps of Christ. If they were being persecuted like Jesus was, that was their sign. We are called to prove our name as Christian by faith and nothing else. And through this faith alone, we get to live into the truth that Jesus Christ has made us right with God. We are justified in Christ. In faith alone, we get to live into the truth that Jesus' life, death, and everything that he has earned in his faithfulness on the cross is ours freely given to us in pure love and grace from God. In faith, we can take hold of a promise that changes our entire lives, freeing us and providing for us in ways this world and its lies and idols never could. Paul says in Galatians, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It is as if Paul were saying, Christ gives me life. He lives in me. What I do, I am not doing. What I say and preach is not my word. Christ is in me. Like Jesus gave up of himself for us, we too are called to give up of ourselves. But the good news that this world will never tell you is that in that empty space that we create in us, God enters in filling us with Christ's own presence for the world. As true Christians, it is indeed Jesus Christ in us who this world meets, the selfless love of God that embraces all. It is simple, and it is up to God. Who, whomever the gospel hits, it hits, and whoever it helps, it helps. And we must act according to it and nothing else. For it has hit us, and it has helped us, and it will continue to help us. For the Christian, it is God who is the center of our lives and the center of our beings, thanks to Christ. It is something that cannot be understood but through the Holy Spirit's revelation to us, an utterly unfathomable thing it is to truly be a Christian. As Martin Luther once said, does the Augustinian order, he was an Augustinian monk, make me a Christian? Or is any other monk made a Christian by his order? No. We are all Christians through faith and baptism. It is not by worldly definitions that we can call ourselves Christian. It is Jesus Christ who gets to define us as his followers. We can claim it by name, but faith in action is the only way it is true. There are many false Christians out there worshiping God as a genie praying for what they want and need and never giving of self as our true Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did. They have never been transformed, and in this they lie to themselves. Take, for example, a faster. 
who accepts the spiritual practice of refraining from food and water. That work does not nor ever could make him a Christian. He should rather be called a faster than a Christian. His fasting does not make him a Christian, not at all. And one who constantly prays should rather be called a prayer than a Christian. Likewise, with a pastor, a virgin, a founder of churches, a tither, that does not make them Christians. What makes one a Christian is to have God and everything that is God's. That is to have the unsurpassable treasure, Jesus Christ. How then do we have Christ? How do I gain and have him then, Luther asks. Ah, you cannot have him except in the gospel in which he is promised to you. That gospel which is folly for the Pharisees and salvation and consolation for believers. And so Christ comes through the gospel into our heart. And he must also be grasped by the heart. Christ is given to us through the gospel in the same way as a person is given a letter in which he's promised a city or a kingdom. And now the letter is sealed as a sign that this promise should and will be kept. And this is the good news. Christ gives to humans a letter, which is the gospel. And this God seals with our baptism and faith. God saying to humans, Look, I tell you and assure you that Christ Jesus, my son, is yours. And I have given you baptism and the sacrament as a true sign and seal in order that you may believe me when I say that Christ is yours. His mercy and grace are given to you without any merit of your own. Only believe me. You will find eternal life in him. Having faith in this, even though you have not seen the place that he has deeded to you, you nevertheless have the letter and the seal as a true sign. Indeed, even though our inherited home is still far away, we have the deed in hand. But our Christian name would not be sufficient, despite our baptisms and our faith, if we did not help our neighbor and draw them to faith through our works in order that they may follow us. For it is in our good example of loving service for neighbor, neighbor that has the power to spread the gospel. We are to work for others, but only after we have given all glory to Christ. Always we're remembering to do to our neighbor as Christ has done to us, in order that we may help them and everyone else. Thus Christ lives in us, and he lives for the betterment of our neighbor, giving to everyone a good example of doing all things in love. So if someone accuses you of forbidding good works, say to them, we don't forbid them. We're only pointing out the abuse of them and showing that they should be done for the inspiration and good of our neighbor and that we should not put our trust into them. So when I help my neighbor, I prove my name as a Christian. Love like that of Christ for all, this is what demonstrates that the faith of Jesus Christ has indeed taken over our hearts and transformed us. This is what makes us confident in calling ourselves Christians. Faith alone. Amen.